The early years of the crowdfunding boom saw magazines like Forbes liken it to a gold rush. But as the third generation of Texan oil drilling ancestors, I think of the video game industry like the oil business. And crowdfunded gaming? Well, that's where the wildcatters are. So what's a wildcatter? In the American oil business, wildcatters are the risk takers who drill in places not yet proven to have worthwhile deposits, or sometimes in places thought dried up. It's a risky business, and it's no surprise that the biggest wildcatter operation in gaming was born deep in the heart of Texas. Generally speaking, the two industries are risk adverse. Video game publishers like petroleum companies like big safe bets they can exploit year in and out. They drill where they know the biggest deposits are because exploration is risky and costly. If you're already sitting on a unit shifting cash producing genre or franchise, you're better off staying put and milking that thing until the last drop of demand is gone. Here were the safe bets of 2012. Not surprising, is it? A lot of shooters, sports franchises, and sequels. There's a LEGO game in here, too. Nice job, Aaron. Now, despite what you may have heard, just because something's popular doesn't mean it's terrible. But nothing here was risky, and everything built for the console player. But there's nothing here to invest my psyche into, and it left me and others like me with questions. What about PC exclusives that pushed hardware to the bleeding edge like the good old days? What about cool niches what like Space Lamps that I grew up loving? But what about the next Star Wars fighter game? But what about, but what an about actual that Wing Commander, Commander MMO that Earth and but Beyond what about usurped? Doing an actual what about Space Sim? Sim? Doing another free space? I want to go back to Fidelity too. Fidelity. Can't I mix up with those actors. They have their souls from the them. Can't jump into it. They really want to get on the piano song. Behold, the Wildcatter pitch. Hi, I'm Chris Roberts. Ever since I saw Star Wars as a wide-eyed eight-year-old, I dreamt of being a hotshot pilot saving the galaxy or a lovable rogue making my way across the cosmos. It inspired me to make Wing Commander and has influenced everything I've done since then. But I don't want to build any old game. I want to build a universe. Chris Roberts, one of the founding fathers of Space Sim Gaming, was back. And he was ready to rush in where even angels dared to tread. So long as you were ready to put your money where his mouth was. If big publishing wouldn't bother drilling out in the forgotten wastelands of yesteryear, Chris Roberts sure as hell would. He used to rule the place. Roberts' pitch was pure Wildcatter theater. You see, the Wildcatters of the early 20th century used crowdfunding too. They sent slick pitches in the mail by the tens of thousands a month to credulous, sometimes dangerously uninformed consumers. The unscrupulous sorts included doctored photographs of huge gushers, as if their work was already well underway and the return on investment was a sure bet, and the checks, cash, and money orders came flooding back in response. Roberts followed the Wildcatter playbook to a T, even if he didn't know it. Just look at his pitch. It almost seemed like the game was halfway done, didn't it? And a lot of us believed it because of how Roberts pitched it. I'm pretty excited by how it's joined out. So why don't you come join me for a sneak peek? So one thing I think you'll all be very excited about is the level of fidelity in space, the graphical detail and the immersion, because it's to a level that I've never been able to achieve before. Everything inside the cockpit operates and moves and works. If I look around the cockpit, you can see uh, the displays, my hands on the throttle, my hands on the joystick. The whole idea is we're immersed fully in a cockpit that's fully rendered in 3D. So if you issue a command, you hit a button, you'll actually see a character doing the cockpit. It's all for the immersion. I'm really excited about the physics, and they're going to be a strong part of the gameplay. So let me demonstrate uh, some of the features of how the physics interacts with how you control. It was a pitch for this incredible new space sim he was building. But what was it, really? It wasn't a game. It was a cinematic for a prototype that, for all practical purposes, didn't exist. We couldn't play it. We watched it. And then we believed in the Robert's dream and gave him money to make that dream game a reality. What return did we expect on our investment? Only the best damn space sim ever made. It was all so confident, you'd forget it wasn't a sure thing at all. Roberts pitched Star Citizen to multiple publishers and investors who either demanded concessions or outright refused. During his GDC announcement, his funding website crashed, strangling incoming pledges to a trickle for the first several days, the most critical time of any crowdfunding venture. And I was there when he was worried sick sitting in Portalarium's office after the show. I heard him pleading and shouting at web developers to fix everything for fear the whole thing would fail. And if it did, then what? If no one, if no one appreciates you for Star Citizen, then I'm sure you'll get a job. <laughs> <laughs>
But that Wildcatter pitch didn't fail. He struck a space nerd spindle top. Roberts got his second chance and he seized on it like a man possessed. Who could blame him? So what did he do once he hit his funding goals? If you think making the best damn space sim was his top priority, <laughs> I've got some bad news. Roberts didn't seem half as interested in the game company he'd started as he was in building a fundraising machine to keep extracting cash from his backers and keep finding more backers to extract cash from. Don't believe me? Just look at how much of the actual game design Roberts outsourced to other companies in those early years. He hired one company to develop AI for his game, another full studio to develop an FPS module, and even more studios to develop assets and commercials. And while a lot of the core game design work was being developed elsewhere, Roberts focused on new ship sales, big marketing events, and new stretch goals to keep fundraising momentum up. The cash grab tactics produced enough backlash that Roberts eventually had to address it directly. Tough talk from a guy who outsourced critical game features like AI and FPS to other studios. Robert struck oil with his pitch, and the pent-up demand from fanboys like me was strong enough to push him right to his funding goals. Yippee! But it wasn't enough. He wanted to get as much cash out of his market as possible. Yet what about that best damn space sim ever made thing he'd been talking about? The one that seemed halfway finished in his 2012 crowdfunding pitch. Well, let me have this fanboy explain it. But belief in itself is a very strong thing. For the majority of people, uh, even for those who have the system requirements that the game demands of them, the game is not playable. And it affects the belief. The game may be broken and barely begun, but it's not for lack of funding or faith. He's raised 30 times as much as he said he needed six years ago, and he's still talking about early stages. It's all physicalized and there's sort of, uh, there was conflict between the animation and the actual physics simulation, which is all stuff we'll dial in and won't be there uh, in the final one, but you know, it's still early stages, so. Robert spent six years manipulating the faithful to extract as much funds as possible. That's what fracking really looks like in a Wildcatter studio like his. It's why the average backer has spent $200, not 60. His reputation as a game developer may be tarnished, but he's a fracking genius when it comes to getting more cash out of his backers. So let's look at some of the tricks that put him in the Guinness Book. They're older than you think, but just as relevant. History may not repeat itself, but it often rhymes. A century ago, a lot of the Wildcatters loved the crowdfunding more than the Wildcatting. They had a word for guys like you and I, the people they could extract the most possible money from. It wasn't backers, it was suckers. Meet Dr. Frederick Cook of New York, the discredited polar explorer. He later became a successful Wildcat fundraising junkie. After suing a Fort Worth publication after an article questioning his methods, a 1923 mail fraud case was brought against him and other oil promoters. It was revealed he'd sent out an average of 300,000 money-seeking letters a month, grossing two million for his company in 1922 alone. He claimed innocence all the way to jail and never let go of that revisionist view of his actions. I've never been accused of having a small vision. Now, Dr. Cook was convicted of mail fraud in a court of law. Many have done the same to Roberts in the court of public opinion. They call Star Citizen an outright scam. And I wouldn't go that far. But we have heard a lot of marketing lies over the years, and not a single apology. To hear Chris's wife and VP of Marketing, Sandy Gardner, explain it, we probably never will. So I don't really see what's deceptive about any <laughs> I just It's not how I think. So when people flamethrow and they send me these long walls of text about how deceptive and everything we are, I'm like, what are you talking about? Do you think it has something to do with what is commonly known as self-entitlement? Thinking suddenly that if you've invested so much, you have a say? Yeah, I mean, but I guess it's, it, for me, it's a matter of perspective in as much that I could go to Las Vegas and blow $3,000 a night on, in a night on table service. Horses for courses. I could go to the racetrack or I could go to the theater or Disneyland and drop a few hundred dollars. That yeah, doesn't mean you own the theater. Right. I can't then go back to Disneyland and say, hey, listen, you give me a refund. I didn't think that train ride was very good. I thought that sucked. You see, 
Deceptively marketed macro transactions in a very late, very buggy, very unfinished game are just the same as any other common goods and services. What's there even to apologize for? The game is not playable. Okay, but what else? If people feel that the obligations of SIG were not met, what they promised not being uh, met, and they stop believing, that money should be given back. Exactly. Wait, what? There was a lot of glitches and bugs. They've since updated. There are still glitches and bugs. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hold on now. It's SIG's fault. They need to be, they need to be put under the gun for this. Alright, that's it. I'm buying another spaceship. The history of wildcatting rhymes in other ways, too. Even without computers, early Fort Worth marketeers compiled huge suckers lists. They had the names and addresses of two million individuals who routinely gave money to speculative ventures. But what if those wildcatters could have gotten their suckers to do the mass mailing for them? Nearly a century later, thanks to the wonders of the internet age, wildcatter Chris Roberts could do just that, and he did. Or rather, Sandy Gardner did. Introducing the Star Citizen Referral System. Here's how it worked. You, a backer, gave a new prospective customer a referral code to use at CIG's store. If they spent at least $40, they got a bonus store credit that they could use towards a spaceship purchase, and you got a recruitment ticket. The more tickets you accrued, the more rewards you unlocked. Sounds a little like a pyramid scheme, doesn't it? The people best able to drive referrals were the signal boosters with megaphones, the Twitch streamers. Here's where we start to see the dangers of monetary fracking. The little fissures created by the demand stimulation effort can eventually lead to earthquakes. It can even poison communities. The referral contest did both. Many backers felt uneasy about promoting a buggy, late, barely started pre-alpha for CIG's coffers. Others felt they couldn't compete with Twitch streamers who had easy access to bigger audiences. The contest felt rigged from the start. But the cheap growth offered by the referral program was just too easy to pass up, regardless of the damage done. Those complaining could frack off. By 2017, CIG was offering a fully paid round-trip flight to Gamescon in Germany, with the hotel and event ticket thrown on top. All you had to do was to be the first person to generate 2,942 referrals. At a minimum, that's $117,680 in revenue for CIG. Even now, the top referrer only has about 2,150 referrals, or at least $84,680. Between the top five referrers, about $353,000 in pledges have gone back to CIG. Not a bad return considering how little it cost them. Unless you factor in the earthquakes of pissed off fans and the poisoning of some goodwill reserves. Even within the context of Star Citizen, you might think someone who'd spent thousands on video game spaceships for a game that wasn't released was kind of a dum dum. Yeah, I was one too. But the thing is, rather than be ashamed of our extravagance, CIG made it a community status symbol because suckers, uh, I mean backers, who spent over $1,000 automatically enjoyed concierge status. Concierge used to mean you got the best class of customer service treatment. Hi, Chelsea. It came with other benefits too, like the rare privilege of owning a concierge card that you had to pay even more money to get. With this concierge card, you'd be granted access to VIP parties that other super dum-dums, I mean super suckers, I mean super backers, were granted access to. The spending habit you might formerly have been a little embarrassed about? That thing that might send your wife or girlfriend into a screaming fit about being a rational man with spending control? It was now a status symbol amongst the high rollers of the citizenry. But guess what? Once you hit concierge level, you discover you're not really part of the Star Citizen High Society yet. In fact, you're just a better class of rabble. After all, basic concierge members don't have access to the Million Mile High Club. You'll need to spend another $9,000 to get behind that velvet rope and enjoy the many luxuries that private club has to offer. Like this bouncer who never moves, this bartender with scalp bitch, these fidelitous decorations and set dressings that serve no function, and of course, lots of fish. Overly complicated in design and hollow in practice, the perfect reward for monetary tithe. CIG incentivizes constant spending with the bestowment of titles that grow ever more prestigious to those with compulsive spending habits and a love of e-ping competitions. 
When you're surrounded by a throng of other lunatics who associate their expenditures on video game spaceships with social status, it turns into a mutual admiration society for the credulous. The incentives to keep spending have less to do with the value of the spaceships bought and more to do with climbing the pecking order in a society of lunatic spenders. I was part of that lunatic society too. I spent thousands, in addition to my investment in Cloud Imperium games, on little pledges here and there. I spent hundreds more on beer runs, meals, and other gifts to CIG employees. When you believe so strongly in something, it feels good to spend money to support it. CIG made it feel almost bad not to. Chris Roberts has fracked backers from every angle to squeeze more money out of their wallets. Next month, he'll be fracking 60 of them face to face with a $350 8 plate dinner event at their LA studio. Only concierge level suckers were offered chances to buy tickets. The $350 spent on top of the $1,000 already wasted grants them an office tour and on site visit with the Wildcatter himself, both of which a lot of whales enjoy for free in earlier years. Unsurprisingly, Wildcatters of the last century had a similar event for prospective investors. They called them oil field tours. And with those catered events, those suckers were fed, and I love this term, cold lunch and hot air. The reason, of course, to frag even more money out of their pockets. There's even a rumor going around, and I state this is a rumor, that these high-status whales might be offered marked up subpenny ordinary shares in the company. These shares are available for public viewing through the UK Clearinghouse, and no one is sure about the share status of the US assets. I'm not sure if I believe it myself, but nothing surprises me from a company that would charge $10,000 to get in-game access to a cheesy luxury bar that someday, maybe years from now, will serve me a Harry Roberts. Even if those concierge members aren't offered shares or a profit-sharing agreement, they've already invested at least $1,350 in a dream. A dream of a pair of space sim games, now four years late and stuck in pre-alpha, that in a fair world would cost about $60 each retail if they were actually finished, which they may never be. It's their sunk cost, a fallacy of a dream space sim galaxy, a galaxy of only three moons and a planetoid after six years of work. But therein lies the beauty of Chris Roberts' whale fracking approach. What has worked for a century in the literal world of speculative oil drilling, works equally as well in the psychological realm of crowdfunded video games. He raised one of the biggest budgets in gaming history. He did it by fracking his buyers. And man, does he frack them hard. Yippee. The little earthquakes and poison communities have been a small price to pay for the rewards, at least for Roberts. The tragedy of it all is, Roberts doesn't start out this way. As we saw in Chapter 2, he was once a bright kid programming at home for the sheer love of the games. Now he seems like a guy more interested in making movies about games so he can keep raising money to make more movies about games so he can repeat the process. CIG has put out over 1,000 videos in the last six years. And how many games have they released? Zero. So how exactly did Roberts go so completely off course? In our next chapter, we'll leave Texas and head further west for a galaxy far, far away where you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy.